Hello, my name is Chauncey Beatty. I'm a poet, a cultural worker, and a consultant. Um, I'm from South Carolina. <laughs> the South uh, creates this mysterious hybrid of silence and yet these juicy stories <laughs> for you to be able to tell. And so um, I think that it influences my writing a lot. I'm always surprised at what comes out with my writing because so much has not been said and I don't even know that I have it in me sometimes. <laughs> so I definitely uh, think my Southern background plays a role in that way. Um, I come from a mother who is uh, always kind of just spitting out these jewels. I always say I learned from my mother's back. My mother was gone quite often. Um, I was raised in a single parent household and she, she was working um, quite often. And so, you know, as she was walking out the door, it was always something that she was kind of putting into my brother and I. And so, um, it's just a lot of my work is the the wisdom of my mother and my grandmother and kind of the women in my family. So. I own a consultant business and I do a lot of self-development um, work. Um, to me, my, my consultant business is Omnific Consulting and Seminars. Omnif Omnific means to have all power in creation. And so everything is a creative process. Everybody is an artist. We are all just having to, I'm trying to help people to tap into their own creative life force. So everything is art. Everything. Oddly, I have the worst spelling in the world. <laughs> so I did not write for a long time because <laughs> I kind of equated my poor spelling to, you know, you can't be a writer, you can't spell, you know. <laughs> and so um, I did not really identify as a writer until around 05 um, when I was in graduate school. And um, I that's when I started saying, oh, maybe I'm gifted. Um, Somehow my writing works. Somehow my poetry works. When spelling doesn't work, when you know, when I can't write technical, somehow poetry comes out in a way that no other writing comes out of me. I wrote this piece after watching um, the movie Precious, um, um, looking at Monique's character at the end. And I'm gonna. This is a spoiler, but I'm okay with it because it was a book. So if you was reading instead of watching TV, no. <laughs> But in the movie, at the end, Monique's character is asked by a social worker, why does she allow her child to get abused? And she said, look at me. You know, who is going to love me? Who is going to make me feel good? And, it, and I thought it was interesting that she used the word, who is going to make me feel good? So it's the exact same thing that Holly Berry said. And Monsters Ball, make me feel good. So it started my wheel spinning with thinking about black women and desirability. And what does it mean with Holly Berry, who is supposed to be the quintessential black beauty, right? Or even not even just black beauty, just beauty, right? She transcends certain racial lines. You know, for her to, to, to be yearning for this desire, to, to, for her to be able to be put in a character that's supposed to be undesirable and have to say, please make me feel good. What does it mean now that Monique is saying the same thing? Who is this woman who is embodied as this fat black woman, right? And so that's what this piece is about. In search of that primitive. Monique, I appreciate your attempt. It takes a true genius to make the mammy beautiful. The way you wear rhinestones on that tattered apron covered in flour and bacon soda, you jazzed up that do-rag glitter and all. The tantalizing red of your service smile lips. Fat black girls needed a new role model. This is not to say other stereotypes do not suffice, they do. But there is something special about a sexy caretaker. Something way more erotic about a woman who can cook bacon and sizzle for a man. Fat has always been the background, the, the bed, the springboard, the hub and hutch of pornography. It is the black maid in the back of 18th century European iconography. It is the spice, the cayenne pepper, Olympia 8, turn her frail white body thick and nasty like prostitutes and apes. The world is always in search of that primitive, the wild and wrong, the deep, deep black. 
You, Monique. Told skinny women they are bitches. Something hip-hop had done enough of, but yeah, I can understand why. Those skinny bitches get all the recognition for the sublime. They get the cover of Sports Illustrated. They get banana skirts and bare breasts popping, popping, popping. There is no holiday to celebrate the way your belly jiggle when you laugh. No store carrying tube tops in your size. You cover your arms with sweaters in the summertime, so you want to offend children and senior citizens. Your body thick and nasty like prostitutes and apes. Monique, you made them split their size laughing with your five words check and jive how amazing the way you say fuck and shit the way you elongate bitch the size of your mouth dancing round you and crash like 1920 flappers like diamond and her little cousin on players club money tell them how good your pudding tastes they may have forgotten watching holly berry suck on them monster balls money tell them tell them how the master crept up into your bedroom after you set heart rollers into the missus hair money tell them tell them how the missus tried to smack the black off your face that morning but couldn't with her baby hanging from your perfect chocolate drop nipples a scene way more erotic than Janet Jackson and I have time strip tease money tell them tell them you are the butter they dip their crab legs in tell them tell them you are the Crisco they fry their chicken and tell them tell them good lord you are the lord make their southern butter beans taste like heaven on earth the fat back in their pot of collard greens the ham hot stuck in their teeth hell no you ain't got no toothpick those skinny bitches are not allowed in your house always trying to upstage you forget Beyonce and her popping like you got your own uh oh uh oh the world watching the earth shake miserable under your half inch heels your body popping 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 times two there are echoes behind your every move that's why people are always telling you to tone it down you are too much too black too fat too loud take up too much space but you you are the most hyper visible invisible you're the woman no man seems to ever really notice you're the pink elephant in the nightclub you're the pretty face, you're the really good friend, you're the woman dying beneath the heavy of her skin, Monique. Tell them. Tell fat black girls they who else is gonna make them feel good. Thank you. I'm laughing because I really don't admit this, but I, I actually started through hip hop, believe it or not. I used to rap, but I, I deny that, so if this video ever comes <laughs> out. So, of course, you know, I'm from the hip-hop generation, so initially I started rapping. Um, but I came out during the era where Lil' Kim was big, and so, you know, I had like a horrible, horrible yuck mouth, like a terrible mouth. So, <laughs> I stopped doing that <laughs> after I didn't agree with what I was writing about. So, um, But um, I think that as a writer, I'm more of an image collector than I am a wordsmith. Like, there are some poets who they're just, they're really, um, they enjoy language. I enjoy images. I'm um, really influenced, influenced by visual artists and other, um, other types of artists um, because for me it's about painting a picture through words. One of the people who I'm really influenced by is a visual art, artist named When Kara. I first was introduced to Kara Walker, it was almost like a permission slip for me that I could talk about the things that I want to talk about because I'm really interested in imagination and memory and um, and so she does a lot of work around um, how the uh, antebellum South is remembered and desire and and when I seen how she used images it allowed me to do the same thing in my poetry. Um, I did a background in psychology and African American and African studies. Um, I pull a lot of theory. Um, I do a lot. I pull a lot of theory in it. I put a lot of uh, my personal history in it, and kind of our collective history, um, and the multiple communities that I belong to, right? Um, because for me, it's it's all one and the same in this kind of weird way, you know. It, and and so you'll find that there's kind of no linear pattern in my writing. It's these pullings of everything, and then I my writing my point is to thread them together to show you how this affects this. So, um, so like I said, just similar to her, I'm trying to capture the way in which we remember. Because sometimes I feel like memory, when we think about history, memory is dismissed. But the way somebody experiences something is way more profound to me than what is actual history. You know, if you smack a person, yeah, like if you look at it, it might be all the evidence is a handprint, this, that, and the third. But we don't really talk about on a psychic level, on a spiritual level, what the smack does. So I'm really interested in that. I think that being embodied as a black female, walking through space and time in this particular body, 
you know, plays such a major role. Black women are still fighting for to be subjects. You know, we've been historically objects, and we're still in this battle to reclaim our own subjectivity. I think that our our stories are so unique in the sense of our voices are just being heard. It's, it's this when you think about the social hierarchies. Oh shit! <laughs> we're the complete bottom, and you know. Um, just kind of, I think that sometimes um, it's going back to what I was saying about history and memory. You know, um, it's time to talk about the impact of stuff. You know, and I think that Black women carry the, the stories of we're we are the carriers of of kind of this, tr this this trauma of the world. You know, because we you know, and so um, yeah, I think it plays a huge part in what stories I tell, how I tell stories. Um, I'm a poet, and so I'm in this weird space where I'm a performance poet as well. So I was just talking about this last night. It's hard for me to find my niche. I feel like my feet, I'm always kind of dancing in multiple spaces, you know. Sometimes people don't want to hear it. They don't want to think, they don't want to hear about, you know, our stories. They don't, they're not interested. You know, this is a story that people have historically not wanted to hear on many levels. Men don't want to hear it because of we're talking about sexism. You know, white folks don't want to hear it because you're talking about racism. You know, people don't want to hear it. You know, so <laughs> so it's it's interesting trying to find those spaces. But in the same time, you know, sometimes you know my you know my my audience you know may be white folks ready to hear who are ready to do some work. You know, I, I guess when it boils down to it, the, my audience is people who are ready to do work. I study a lot of people. There are some people that are like directly in my life and there are some people that are kind of silent mentors that they don't know they're my mentors because I'm just watching them from afar and they don't know me. <laughs> but um, some women, I would say, uh, of course, my mother, my grandmother. Um, I would also say, like I said, Kara Walker. And I'm going to mention this woman and it's going to be a little bit controversial, but I'm going to say RuPaul. And I know that sounds like you know, some women would be outraged because, you know, it's a man, it's a woman. RuPaul is one of the artists that are, very, that is very influential to me. You know, for um, a man of color to be able to go into the mainstream as a drag queen. And, I mean, people, everybody knows you better work, you know, whether or not you realize it's RuPaul, that it's this, you know, queer man singing a song, you're singing his song. and. He's just such a powerful person. He's very, you can tell he's very spirit, spirit led and he's, he knows his value and his worth on this earth. And so when he presents himself as a woman and, and as, as a man, it's one of my influential women, believe it or not. I'm also influenced by Ella Baker, um, political activist. I'm also influenced by um, um, just kind of some feminist writers, uh, Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins. Um, I'm also influenced by Suzanne Stevens. She is the director of Hope Springs Institute, which is a nonprofit um, retreat and learning space in Ohio. Um, I'm on their board of directors, but she, to me, helps me understand really the power of creation and vision. You know, she carved out the space in Ohio, where it sits on 130 acres of land that's just for people to come to work on healing work. Um, and it's beautiful, you know, and it started, I, I, to watch her, you know, it's been there 15 years. I've only been working with them for the last three years, but I watch her process and how she starts something, you know, the seed she plants and how she waters it until it becomes something. And so she's also influential. Um, who else? Sabrina Jackson Gandy, writer, Oprah Winfrey, actually. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. I'm a big reader. <laughs> like, so in my world, in my little bubble, and I realized that I I don't live, you know, my life is not like the average person in the sense that I don't have a TV in my house. Like, I have books. Um, which is funny because, like, I watch horrible TV when I do watch TV. I love all the horrible stuff. <laughs> I read a lot, but I realized that that's not the average household, you know? Um, and I didn't, it, it's odd, cause I didn't start reading until I got into college, believe it or not. And my mom was a reader. My house, I grew up in a house full of books, but again, I can't spell, so I just, it just shut down everything. I'm like, I'm not reading, I can't spell, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so, 
So, um, I didn't start reading until I had to, until I was in college, and either you read or you failed, you know? So, um, and then that's when I got, became more interested in reading. And another thing that I've noticed, I will say about reading, I'm finding that a lot of people dismiss fiction. Like, they think that we shouldn't read fiction. And I love reading fiction. I, um, I'm finding that if you look historically at what fiction has done, even in a political sense, you know, like writers like uh, uh, Rachel Grimke, who, you know, wrote the play Rachel, I mean, um, excuse me, uh, Ale uh, Angelina Grimke, she wrote the play Rachel. Um, you know, it's, it's a work of fiction, but it was used to um, combat lynching. You know, I mean, I think that the possibilities of, of fiction writing, the possibilities of, of storytelling to me is vast. I think that we have gotten away from thinking, from understanding the power of writing, what is considered important, you know, um, what is considered to be valuable enough to be a part of the canon. You know, like those are the questions that we have to ask. I don't think that there's a lack of access as it used to be. Um, you can pretty much get your hands on whatever you want to. It's, who is still deciding what's important? Um, you know, we're in, in we're in the information age, we're in the technology age. So I think that there is access to stuff better than there have been historically. Um, especially with youth, I think that you know, like I said, I didn't really read growing up, but I had a misperception about books, about writing that um, it had to be something that wasn't of interest to me. I couldn't tell my story. I couldn't write about what I wanted to write about. And I guess if I was talking to a kid, I would tell them, you know, there's so much access to the things that you are excited about, you know, and the world is seeking for you to unfold. We want your story. So, you know, just to, you know, to tap into themselves and then to share that. Part of what I believe that I'm doing is taking all of this information that I'm sitting there reading and translating it to the everyday person. Um, and so in that regard, you know, um, I have learned how to give them a story and paint a vivid enough picture where they feel like they're watching TV, <laughs> you know, but they're still really getting access to information that people might even be intimidated to try to read. Because like I said, some of my stuff is, is heavy academic jargon. I mean, it's very academic, you know, type work. So it, for me, it's like almost this, I serve as this uh, kind of liaison between the, the the academy, the TV, the you know, to the everyday person. I feel like at the core of everything that I do, my my work, my um, my consultant work, poetry, academic work, is to is to help us to realize what our value is. Um, I think that we get caught up on our bodies, on difference, on uh, kind of this physical journey that we have and then we forget that we really are an extension of God attempting to unfold. And so I am trying to help people um, learn and then unlearn and then relearn again, if that makes sense. <laughs> and to remember, to remember who we are because, um, you know, oftentimes we're told otherwise.